Welcome to Respond to Violence, Communities in Crisis. I'm your host, Robert Jordan. This program will take a look at the impact violence is having on Chicago and its surrounding communities. We'll hear from health and legal specialists, political representatives, and from grassroots activists. They will help us explore the scope of the problem, why it continues to escalate, and possible solutions. Later in the program, we'll open the conversation to audience members on the front line who will share what they are seeing as well as the strategies to solve the problem. But first, let's take a look at the issue. The scene is all too familiar. A hot summer night, unsuspecting young people, the sound of gunfire. Chicago is a city under siege. Communities live in fear of senseless violence, and families seem to be constantly mourning the loss of life and the shattering of dreams. The worst tragedies occurred during summers. It appears that heat and homicides go hand in hand. The numbers speak to an epidemic of violence raging out of control, with communities like Inglewood, West Pullman, and Lawndale feeling like war zones. Though officials say the numbers are down, with 900 homicides recorded in 1992 and 560 in 2012, the reality speaks to a city in crises, with violence erupting in suburban neighborhoods usually considered safe. Children as young as six months have been wounded and killed by gunfire, causing fearful parents to create a safe passage program for their school-bound kids. But this simply is not enough. Much more needs to be done. As citizens watch the incidents of shootings escalate, most wonder and debate what should be done. Who besides perpetrators should be held accountable? What steps must we take to save our children, our neighborhoods, and ultimately our way of life? How should we respond to violence? We've gathered a panel of experts to discuss the violence epidemic and its impact on our communities. Irv Miller is an attorney and legal analyst for Channel 2 News Chicago. Marlita White is the director of the Office for Violence Prevention for the City of Chicago's Department of Public Health. And Congresswoman Robin Kelly is the Democratic representative for the 2nd Congressional District of Illinois. Welcome all of you to this program. Let's start with Representative Kelly. Uh, what is happening in Congress right now that's being done to try and address this problem of violence? Frankly, not enough. Um, there was a lot of effort toward passing a background check, and uh, we came very close. And it was actually led by a senator who was NRA A-rated, but he saw the need that we needed to do something, but we just couldn't get enough votes in the Senate uh, for the bill to pass. So there is still bipartisan effort for a background check vote, but because of all the other things that have been going on with the shutdown and those kind of things, um, that hasn't been brought to the floor yet, but actually there's bipartisan support uh, for that bill. I don't know if it's enough. It's in the House, uh, but we're hoping. You know, people whom you talk to, I think, would like to ask people in Congress, do you know what we're going through here? Do they know? You know, we, um, there were Newtown parents, our parents from the Chicagoland area, parents from Arizona, that actually came together on the Hill and lobbied the Senate about the background check bill. So uh, they know whether they take it as serious as we think they should take it. It seems like when there's mass murders, it gets a lot of or mass shootings, a lot of attention. But when it's, you know, one by one or every weekend, those don't get as much attention. And, and I, for one, want to show people it's just as important a loss of a life or uh, if you're wounded, it's just as important if you're in the Chicago area or if you're in the movie theater or in a school. And sometimes I just think it doesn't get the same amount of attention, but I think we're changing that, and especially the parents and some in this audience came to D.C. What about guns getting into the hands of youth? Do we know how this is happening? Uh, trafficking, uh, straw purchases, um, we need to do something about that. I have two nephews that are Chicago police officers, and that's something that they 
speak with me about and even McCarthy he just says there's such a proliferation of guns in Chicago more than New York which is almost three times as big as Chicago and more than Los Angeles so it's gun trafficking straw purchasing um, also um, people need to speak up um, I, I just can't believe that you know people in the neighborhoods don't know what's going on but also on the other hand they're probably afraid which I understand that too I'd also like to pose this question to the panel. The uh, city of Chicago's Youth Violence Prevention Plan has a goal of cutting violence in half by 2020. And we're almost halfway into the plan. So what's been effective, what has not, what's working? Let's start with you, Earth. What's working is, unfortunately, increased law enforcement. We have more policemen on the streets, and you go through the safe passage zones now in the morning. Uh, near the schools and you have policemen on every corner, there's firemen on another corner, there's City of Chicago streets and sanitation workers there to protect the kids. Uh, that's not the way it's supposed to be. It, 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 you don't need a cop on every corner if things are going right. And unfortunately when you get to the criminal justice system, that shouldn't be the first line of defense, that should be the last line of defense. When you get to 26 in California for the noon bond court every day, uh, when, you, when you spend a night in the police station and, 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 and the judge looks down and says, didn't I just see you here two weeks ago, which is a regular occurrence. And then you look in the audience and you have all the moms and all the dads and the uncles and the aunts, they're all there for that. But where were they before the bond hearing? Uh, where was the educational system before the bond hearing? So when you get to that point at 26 and Cal, you've already lost the battle. Maybe not the war, but you've lost the battle. Marlita, the city of Chicago, we, we hear press conferences from the mayor, the superintendent of police all the time. Do they have a plan that, I know they say that the numbers are down, are reflecting um, fewer murders, fewer crimes, but for many people who are victims, that's not enough. I really can speak about the work that we do out of the Office of Violence Prevention in the Health Department. We certainly are part of the mayor's overall strategy, um, but my office's work focuses on prevention. And for some people who are caught up in the intervention part of it, where they're unfortunately suffering the loss of a person or have um, gone through an injury, that feels like it's too late. But our charge is to hold that front door open for prevention. And so me and my small team um, we're out there working with organizations across Chicago that are focused on prevention, that understand that when children are exposed to violence, even at the age of zero to five, when their brains are just developing, that that changes how their brains work and it can change it for the rest of their lives. And so for me, that is a part of what is working, that Illinois and especially in Chicago, we have partners that are involved in this trauma-informed movement. Congresswoman Kelly, you mentioned gun laws. Um, are there sufficient laws on the books now, or do we have too many laws, uh, which is something we're going to talk to about a little later, but talk to us about laws on the books currently and the effect positively or negatively. Well, I don't think there's sufficient laws. Again, I think that we need to have uh, background checks. We need to know who has guns and those who shouldn't have guns shouldn't have them. Also, we need to close the uh, gun show loopholes and I don't know why like the uh, person in Los Angeles why did he have you know the capacity he would have had he could have killed everyone in the terminal because of you know the the capacity of the magazine that he had you know the high capacity magazines and you're certainly not going hunting for animals with that because you wouldn't be able to eat them after or even hang them up on the wall so I don't I know there are laws on the books like Chicago has laws but if um, Indiana doesn't have the same laws or Kentucky or Mississippi then it almost doesn't matter in a way you know what Chicago has if everyone around them has different laws because we can cross the state line right. and buy right exactly Eric what are your thoughts on guns or rather on laws that uh, currently apply to ownership and and the fact that uh, it seems that as the congresswoman mentioned if they're all around us, uh, what good do the laws here do? Well, I agree with the congressman about what is lacking, but I have to, also have to say you have to deal with some constitutional realities. We live in a constitutional society. We have certain constitutional provisions that are supposed to protect us, but yet they hurt us in ways, but that's our constitution. 
we have the right to bear arms now. There's no question about it. The Supreme Court says you have the right to protect yourself. You can't have laws stopping people from carrying guns on the street. We have Fourth Amendment rights. You have protections against searches and seizures, illegal searches and seizures. Taking those into account, then you have to face the reality. What can we do to make it right for the legal owners of guns to have their guns, but yet protect the public from those who shouldn't? Obviously, convicted felons, they should not have guns. There's laws on the books to protect that right now. There's laws on the books to protect gun use and things like that. The question is, what should the penalties be? Should we have mandatory minimums that go higher, or should judges have discretion? I think the talk these days about raising mandatory minimum sentences for, drug offen for uh, gun offenses is more about taking discretion away from judges than it is actually sending people to the penitentiary. Because judges have the authority now to send people, to first offenders, to the penitentiary. It's not done. So the question is, do you have mandatory minimums, first offender, should they go to the penitentiary? Most judges don't think so. Most people in, in the criminal justice system don't think so. So it's, a, it's a, a question for legislators to decide public policy issues. Where do we draw the line to protect the constitutional rights, to protect the safety of the public, and to punish those who deserve to be punished? One of the laws now, it's not a new law. RICO's been out there for quite some time. The uh, Racketeering uh, Influence and Corrupt uh, Organizations Act is designed to assist law enforcement fight organized crime, but I understand that they're trying to use that when it comes to criminal enterprises today. Do you think it's effective? Well, the RICO that you've been talking about has been a federal crime. It's been around for a long time. It was, it was you know, from prohibition days and things like that. Uh, June of last year, the Illinois legislature passed a RICO law in the state of Illinois. And uh, we've had some recent prosecutions. And it's absolutely appropriate. It's absolutely the way to go at it. What it targets is the head of the gangs. The kids go out and do the shooting, but they're reporting to the gang leaders. This RICO law allows law enforcement to get everybody in this web, everybody in the net, the, the shooters, the planners, the hierarchy of the gangs. And it's just started. It's brand new. It hasn't been tested by the appellate courts. But I think it's going to be a major tool in law enforcement once it gets started. One of the things I'm going to ask um, some of our panel members later is just this very point. Um, I've been told that we are in this problem today because we chopped off the heads of the gangs when there were probably maybe three or four or five major organizations around the area. Now we have 200 because they're block by block as opposed to area by area, and that's accounting for so much of the violence. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure that this has been an effective way to deal with gangs. Well, we haven't really used it yet because it just became law a little over a year ago. And these are uh, types of prosecutions that take months to put together. It talks about instead of just catching somebody on the street with a gun, it's using wiretaps. It's listening to telephone conversations. It's police surveillance. And you don't just arrest one or two. You're talking about arresting 20 or 30 people based upon the one RICO charge. And unfortunately, uh, the problem is, no secret, it's gangs, it's drugs. And they don't learn from uh, all their buddies going to jail. They don't learn from their buddies getting murdered on the street. The hierarchy continues. There's always somebody to take the place of somebody that goes to jail or gets killed. And that's the major problem that this RICO law, I think, will address. And eventually, it'll get all these gangbangers, not all, but as many of them as can, off the street. Can the city work in preventive areas, Marlita, in this respect with the gangs? What can be done? Well, our office um, and then many of our partners, again, we really are working on the other end of this conversation. We're working with families who have children zero to five who sometimes are only coming into contact with caregivers or providers because of the 15 year old and or they've gotten you know sus suspended from school or they're in trouble in some way or maybe they're stressing the family. But our conversation with the families and with the whole community is that the greatest opportunity for intervening is really when that child is exposed initially, all the way down the pipeline, when they're still in the crib, even before they're talking. And so for us, we see that gain because we're working with families who begin to understand some of the things that their children are exposed to, and they're making different choices based on those kinds of restorative conversations. So you are aiming a lot of your efforts at families then to try and slow the spread of gangs or the results of the gang activity? For us, we don't really distinguish between, we're looking at violence. 
And so violence for us is a public health issue. It moves across categories. So whereas someone may have a grant to do domestic violence, and someone else has a different grant to do gang intervention, and someone else has a different grant to do teen dating violence, from our perspective, it's all violence. And it's one conversation about risk, risk factors, how do you create a protective environment to push down the risk factors. And, and so we don't really go into a community or engage some of our community partners because they have a gang violence problem. It's really because how can we help educate this community about the impact of exposure to violence on young children? And then our role as a technical advisor is to help them utilize that in whatever capacities they have as an organization. So what do you do? Do you have counselors going into the community? Do you wait for families to come to you? What, what's the so plan? So we, we really have a combination. And so our work, we don't really do single fingerprint work. We um, work in coalition. So we will never have enough staff in our office, and we, that's not our goal. So our goal is to engage many of the groups that are here and people who are in their networks so that we're providing education. We're bringing capacity to communities and to people who are doing that work so they have a different understanding of their role and how to transmit that information to the next family and to the next coworker. Because we also find many of the people who are doing the work, who are out there trying to help families, they have their own story to tell about not getting the help they needed as well. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, Cure Violence, formerly known as Cease Fire, is an organization whose violence prevention work is based on the innovative research of founder Dr. Gary Slutkin. Dr. Slutkin discovered similarities between the spread of disease and the spread of violence and then developed a project that targets street violence as if it were a disease. Shelley Williams is a Cure Violence Project Manager in the Inglewood community. Welcome, Mr. Williams. Thank you for having me. I you. wanted to talk to you about the program and how you go about your work. What is the basis of what you do? Day-to-day -day work that we do is constant visibility in the community. So the, the, the art and science involved with violence interrupters and our outreach team is to do troubleshooting, post-taking, and, and, and really understanding where uh, violent episodes occur. We treat violence as a disease because we, we understand by um, scientific data where the, the violence is happening the most. So the clustering is one area. And word of mouth is really key because we've been around since 2000 in Chicago, in the Chicago area, you know, we get those phone calls, we get those concerned citizens that reach out to us. And, and um, the, the work that we do is preventive. We write on the front end of the violence. So by, by, by saying that, we deploy the violence interrupters and the outreach team to go in front and mediate conflicts using a, a variety of uh, techniques. So if you get a tip that some, something is going down in an area, mm -hmm. you go there and try to uh, step in between both sides? Do you talk to both sides? Precisely. You know, um, what makes us unique and effective is that, you know, in our hiring process, we identify those individuals that have the most inroads with, with this high-risk population. We have a criteria associated with what, with whom it would be considered high risk. And it's all about the right workers. We do the work that some people can't do with degrees or what have you and get right in there where, and meet people where they at. So does this mean that you use people from the community, possibly gang members, possibly people who've got records? Yes, we do. Most, most of our line staff are former high-risk individuals themselves. So they have the respect, they understand the terrain, and they, they are able to navigate through those, um, those high-risk areas. Is this dangerous work? It's very dangerous. It's, it's definitely not uh, for the faint of heart. The, 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 the data suggests that that 41% of, um, of mediations, it was suspected that a gun was at the actual mediation. So, you know, we rely on statistical measures of um, effectiveness and accountability. So, you know, our evaluation team, you know, feeds us back the, the um, best practices after we obtain uh, the information from, from the street. Do you have any, any statistics on how well this works? 
Well, we, we've been proven effective by both the Department of Justice, um, you know, and John Hopkins, you know, and um, the, the statistics show that uh, in the areas that we populate, it is 37% um, decline in shootings in those areas that we, that we uh, inhabit. One of the things that, um, you know, we, we like to think about is that community activists are on top of uh, mm -hmm. some of the issues that are going on. So if you had your way, how would you expand your program? How would you make it better? Data suggests that, you know, the more mediations that are done, the less, uh, well, or there is a decrease in shootings and homicides. So if I had my way, it would be more boots on the ground. Um, in those areas. You take an area like Inglewood, where I'm the program manager, we, we only inhabit 20% of that geography right there. So, you know, it would suggest that if it was more, it was, if the program was expanded, we can affect more people in, in uh, the work that we do. It sounds like a tool that, um, that hopefully has some positive ends. Uh, Irv, what are your thoughts on this? Uh, it's, it's been criticized by some who say that, uh, you know, you've got the, the fox guard in the hen house. Um, do you think it's... You know, I think it's a, it's a necessary component, but I think there has to be a lot more that goes along with it to complement it. Mm -hmm. And I think the first level of the complement that it needs in our society is the family. I've seen a recent trend in my cases, something that I've never seen before. I'll go into court and a bond will be set on a, on a defendant on a shooting case and the, the parents won't come up to me and say how much do we have to post. They will say to me, we're not going to post it. We're going to let them sit. We want to teach them a lesson. Well, again, that may be a little bit late in the process, but I think it, it's a recognition by families that they have an obligation to do something. It's not up to the community. It's not up to the Congress. It's not up to the state legislature. It starts in the home. And that's where I think that I think that things are, the trend is going that way. And I have to compliment the, the, the media because you show these shootings on a nightly basis. You show the problems in the community. And I think the media, you know, deserves some credit for that. All right, thanks, Irv. Well, even when you've done everything right to prevent violence from infecting lives, uh, it appears that there is no sure way to avoid an epidemic. The Holt and Pendleton families know this all too well. And on separate afternoons, five years apart, their lives were changed forever. So I called my firehouse first, which is not far from Percy Julian High School, and I asked the Lieutenant Kendrick, I said, Bill, have you guys gotten any calls over to Julian? Have you heard anything going on down there? He go, no, Cap, just, it's all right, calm down. I said, no, they said Blair's been shot. He said, Cap, I'm sure nothing happened to Blair, because everybody knows he is a good kid. And I'm like, mm-mm, this don't feel right. I jump in my car. I started driving. I can tell you, I blew a bunch of lights trying to get to where I was going. I knew by working in that neighborhood which hospitals to go to. So I went to Little Company and Mary first. And in the meantime, I'm calling Ronnie, his dad, and I'm like, Ron, Ron. And I said, what's wrong? What's wrong? And I started sensing there was a sense of urgency. He says, uh, I got a call that Blair and some kids were shot on the bus after school. And I said, whoa, wait a minute. Are you what are, you, what are you talking about, shot? I drive to uh, Christ and I know, I just, I don't even know how I got there. By the time I got there, there were all types of uh, people. Of course, uh, uh, Annette was there, and then people started showing up. Firefighters and police officers, his classmates from grammar school, high school, family, everybody just starts converging. Then the actual surgeon came out. I remember uh, the doctor was saying, he says, you know, uh, he says, you know, Blair was a fighter. You know, he, was a, he was a fighter, and we kept calling him back. And we kept calling him back, and I said, and I just looked at him, I was like, I was standing there and I said, don't tell me this. Don't tell me this. And then I'll never forget when we finally got to see him the last time, and um, I just looked at him, and 
you know, touched his face, his arms, his head, his, you know, just everything that was visible. And I was like, I was like, I, I can't believe this. We just talked. I said, we just talked. Six years, it's still hard to talk about your child in the past because when somebody is good, you don't expect this to happen to them in life. This is not what I ever dreamed would happen to my child. I could see other people's kids headed there, but not mine, not mine. You know, me and Ronnie did all we could to protect Blair, probably much, much more than we should have, but it didn't work. She was very caring and just endearing. She would um, always want the best for everyone else. So even if she saw someone in a hurtful situation or um, being talked about or scolded, she would be that person that would befriend them and tell her friends because they need a friend too. So um, I don't think there's anything we can do to ever move past what happened. There's Mm, there's Things nothing. That we can do to cope yeah, with what there's happened. nothing we can do to move past it. But um, what we can do is um, what we've been doing, and that is try and figure out ways to make things better for those that um, still have their family intact. Yeah, I mean, I think her death has uh, thrusted both of us in um, a movement now to raise a lot of awareness. Every day that we wake up, we have an obligation to, to ourselves, to the worlds we've created, and to society. Communities need to get definitely more involved in um, what's happening on their own blocks. Sooner or later, which we, uh, I wouldn't wish on my worst enemy. No. Nope. This tragedy could uh, come to your doorstep. Your, could knock on your door. And uh, that's the last thing that you ever want to hear. So, just get involved. According to national statistics from the Children's Defense Fund, only 20% of black and Hispanic eighth graders read at the eighth grade level. 60% of black and Hispanic students graduate from high school. Now compare that to the U.S. Bureau of Justice Department's figures that show more than 800,000 black males are in prison, while only 1.2 million black males, 18 and over, are in college. Now, many would say that these numbers reflect the high price of low expectations and the cost society is paying is staggering. Several months back, First Lady Michelle Obama expressed concern about the future of our nation's children and she put forth a call to action. This is a moral obligation because ultimately, this city and this community will be judged not just by the beauty of our parks and lakefront or the vitality of our businesses, but by our commitment to our next generation. I think my husband put it best when he spoke to the people of Newtown, Connecticut back in December. And he said, this is, this is a quote, this is our first task, caring for our children. It's our first job. If we don't get that right, we don't get anything right. That's how, as a society, we will be judged. And by that measure, can we truly say as a nation that we're meeting our obligations? Are we meeting our obligations, Congresswoman, um, the way we should? No, oh, I think more needs to be done. Children are our first obligation. They are the future. We need to do a better job in protecting them. And it's more than laws. It's, it's laws, it's mentoring, it's good after school programs, it's um, really, it takes a village, you know, as has been said many times, it takes all of us to make their lives better. There are people that are um, doing things to make life better for kids or showing them a more positive way and even the Holtz and the Pendletons, they don't have to be here. They could just, um, you know, mourn alone in a way, but they're so courageous because they're out in front and they're trying to make a difference uh, for the next family. And I just respect them and the other family so much that, that I've worked with and, be, and been around. 
and I, I think all of us do, and uh, we all respect and, and, and value uh, the work that you're doing. At what point should we intervene, Marlene? We have to intervene at the earliest possible point. Um, for some reason, we really, as a culture, pay attention once we're already down this pipeline or we're down the road and uh, children are starting to display trouble and families are starting to have disruptions. And from our perspective, from a public health perspective, you have to front load those things, put in those protective factors early on. And so we want universal daycare and child care, but we also want those providers to understand the kinds of concerns that children are walking in with. And so children in that age group, that pre-K age group, get discharged from school, expelled effectively from school more than any other age group, all the way up until a child can be eligible for graduation from high school. And so that means the early care audience has to understand what traumatized children look like and what they need. And we have to engage parents as partners. I think that we are very often in the position of pointing fingers and trying to figure out who is doing it wrong. And from our perspective, we have to change that paradigm and figure out how we together begin to speak in one voice, start to learn about those practices that make a difference, and really kind of support one another because the other way, the fractured approach, is not working. Okay. Al Stinson is a counselor uh, for Becoming a Man. BAM, as it's called, is a youth guidance organization that was recently evaluated by the University of Chicago's Crime Lab, and the results were impressive. It showed that BAM's model reduced violent crime arrests by 44%. Now, uh, failing grades were reduced by 37 percent, and graduation rates increased by as much as 23 percent. Mr. Stinson, those are some impressive numbers. Uh, how are you doing that? Um, first off, I'm, I'm not jumping for joy because we still got so much work to do. We only just scratching the surface. Uh, but what we do, I think our organization is so passionate about the work we do. And a lot of young men, they gravi gravitate to that. Uh, we get the luxury of being inside of the schools. And they're looking for connections. And the thing is, what we get, we get the opportunity to do, we connect with them on each domain, on the physical domain, the intellectual, the emotional, and the spiritual. Because our young men, they are hurting. And they don't have that space and that trust to talk about that. And with BAM, they get the opportunity to explore all that hurt, all that trauma. And then what's great about us, we can get, we get them a value system. And we ask them to trust that value system. And we make that connection. That's a different connection from the street connection. Explain how you do that. I mean, do you sit down with the kids? Do we, you nurture them one-on-one? -on -one? What do you do? We do group, uh, group once a week with the young men. And we do individual counseling. But like I say, once we do the group, we do a lot of group missions, rights of passage, character development. And they started to gravitate towards it uh, because they started to trust. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of our young men don't trust men because of what we did to them. But once they see that, okay, I can trust Mr. Stinson. He understand my pain. He not talking at me, he talking to me. And it's about building that relationship because they don't have those positive relationships with men, especially men in our communities. And I just think that's one thing that we really great at is being the RBAs. When I mean RBAs, that's relationship bank accounts. And they know we invest in that. How many members do you have? Uh, right now, I have 30 young men in my group at Manly. But we're serving like 1,400 students throughout the city of Chicago. We're in like 30 schools right now. When you say young men, what ages are you talking about? Um, I got between ages 13 and 17. Um, I got a freshman and sophomore group this year. So the adult males then are working with uh, teenagers exactly. or young teenagers. And that's where the mentoring begins? Yes. And like I say, it's, it's a trust factor. And uh, just, just knowing their trauma and their pain, and personally, I was there. So I, I, I connect to the anger. And I, it's, it's, it works for me because I know what it feel like. And so I disclose that. Uh, that. This is how I got through my anger. I understand that, that other connection, what we're looking for. And we get real personal with that. And like I say, when you start to open up and give a little bit, they're going to give a lot back in return. 
There are many professionals that experience our city's violence in a way that impacts them personally. Loretta Purnell James and Elgin Holt are two first responders who recently shared their story. As a professional, I have to come in and, and do my job as a police officer, uh, whether that's getting there and, and, and you know, squashing a scene, uh, bringing some type of order to the chaos that comes with uh, violence. Uh, violence, is we know in Chicago, it, it's a day out and day in thing. It, it occurs 24-7. It, it could occur at any time. The way it occurs, you're seeing maybe a decay in the quality of life now, especially for the young kids and the teens that are going to school then, but a quality of life, a life issues where there is a sense of, of fear. What you have now, you have a younger group, they don't follow the rules. Uh, you have now like countless fashions of the games. So therefore there is no leadership. Uh, shooting can be over just in altercation, a verbal altercation. But we have to be in partnership with some of the, 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 the community, the faith-based community, the, the politicians have to be involved, the, the schools have to be involved, other entities and organizations have to be involved because you cannot let up on them. You have to stay in, you have to go right to the source of the problem. As police officers, we're engaging the community, we're talking, we're trying to break that ice between them and us and, and let them know it's not us and then you, but it's us together. In the first school where I taught, I was in a classroom that had bullet holes in the window. And it was a constant daily reminder that I worked in a neighborhood that was severely impacted by violence. When I became a teacher, I was interested really in exploring the traumatic effects of violence on children because I felt then, as I do now, that those effects were not being significantly recognized and or addressed. In the community where I work, unfortunately, violence is a constant. But when the students arrive at school, it's our responsibility to teach in spite of what happens on the street. And so we have to redirect them in a way that is firm, but in a way that is also caring and understanding of what they go through on a daily basis. I remain very hopeful about Chicago and the future of the children in our city. They're very resilient. They have wonderful, dedicated teachers teaching them. And I think that despite the headlines that we've had here in this city, that we're on the right track. And all we need to do is to include more of the teacher's input and experiences and to recognize that our children need our love and attention and guidance now more than ever before. Congresswoman, you've uh, been talking with teachers in and around the Chicago area. What are they telling you? You know, it's not just now things that I'm hearing, but just over the years that um, I remember speaking with, I think she was a dean or a principal, and what they feel that parents aren't involved enough or they have, um, when the parent is supposed to come and get the report card to hear how the child is doing, and not a lot of parents show up, or the PTA doesn't have a lot of parents in it, so they can't do as many activities with the kids, or there's no after school programs, and I know I hear over and over the most dangerous time of day is from three to six or four to seven when students get out of school, which is, you know, pretty amazing, but usually parents are at work. And uh, so just, I think, more parent involvement. And of course, most teachers that you speak to, you know, want more resources in the classroom or for after school activities. But um, some have told me that some of the young kids they deal with and at a younger and younger age, you know, that they are violent or that's the way they deal with issues instead of, you know, uh, mediation, negotiation, or that kind of thing, they turn to violence um, first. If we don't hear the numbers from, the, you can talk to the, the Chicago Teachers Union, uh, and peop, uh, Chicago uh, Public Schools, and they'll tell you some alarming numbers about assaults on teachers. Mm -hmm. And this may go back to what uh, Brother Stinson was talking about, about somehow you need to get through to the kids that, hey, we're all pulling on the same side of the rope here. Right. 
Well, you know, what about the Department of uh, Public Health and training teachers uh, to try and more effectively work with youngsters? Is that something that's being done? So we have an opportunity, for example, to talk with young children and then some of their um, instructors about teen dating violence and so where that fits. Some of us in the room are focused on domestic violence and we're of course concerned about some of the lethal acts that come out of domestic violence where people are killed by their partner and then as I've already spoken a lot of our work focuses on that very young child. But we have um, a grant through the Centers for Disease Control, our teen dating violence prevention grant, which is Chicago Dating Matters. But we're working in 12 schools, it's not all the schools in Chicago, but we're piloting interventions with the sixth graders, seventh graders, and eighth graders, really beginning to teach them about healthy relationships before they start dating. So what we're trying to do is to make sure that this kind of intervention works before it goes full scale. But, you know, that's a part of how you introduce and really inoculate young people from violence and seeing violence as a tool that you play out in your relationships over time. And the work to educate instructors is a part of that. Also educating community members. So we're trying to bring, as a part of that intervention, the, the instructors and the other members of the school community, as well as the young person, into contact with that kind of curriculum. According to a recent firearms report from the University of Chicago Crime Lab, people convicted of illegal gun possession are four times more likely to be rearrested for murder than other felons. Now, this seems to support the call for stiffer firearms sentencing by law enforcement officials. So how do we balance holding individuals accountable uh, with our obligation to redirect their young lives? Victor Dixon is the uh, president of the Safer Foundation, and Victor joins us now. And Victor, this is one of the things that we have been talking about. Safer works to help reduce recidivism by supporting people with criminal records. So talk to us, please, about the impact of felony over-sentencing uh, versus getting tough on crime. Well, Bob, uh, any time a person is convicted and they have a criminal record, uh, they have an enormous set of barriers to entering and re-entering society. It's difficult for them to become employed. Uh, they may not be able to go back and live in the housing they lived in. Uh, they, in some cases, can't get certain financial aid for college. They can't get food stamps. Uh, there are all sorts of issues. So, you know, you're starting out with a population of people. If you think about in Chicago, half of the people incarcerated in the city of Chicago come from seven neighborhoods, seven communities, three on the west side, four on the south side. That, rep that makes up 21% of the people incarcerated in Illinois. So just any time that you serve, you, you face these barriers to being able to put your life back together, and even if you want to make a change, and many people after they've, they've served time, they want to make a change, they have enormous barriers. Adding to those sentences, um, you know, what that will do is basically, if they had a job, that gap in their employment is even larger, which is very difficult to explain to employers. If they had any kind of work skills before, uh, those skills and that knowledge is going to be obsolete in three years, four years, five years. Um, their families uh, are impacted, their, their children. So, you know, that's the issue with um, a lot of the extended sentences that we face. You know, I'm on the, the board of the Safer Foundation. You know, I've yes. spoken with a lot of uh, young men over the years who will tell me I committed that crime, I've got a felony, I made a bad choice, I'm not right. a bad person. And they've got that felony on their backs for the rest of their lives. Right. And that makes it so tough as you just mentioned, to get a job, to do, to excel, to exceed, to succeed in life. Um, are our laws too tough in that regard? Should we well, look I, at expungement in some areas more? Uh, absolutely, and, and there's a lot of work that's been done to uh, be able to seal records after a period of time, um, to expunge records, to, so it doesn't become a lifetime sentence. And so right now, uh, a felony conviction is a lifetime sentence to a second-class 
citizenship in our country. So we refer to people as returning citizens because we have to think about they've paid the price, they've, they've been punished for their crime. Uh, when do we allow them to return to being a citizen? Because if we don't, if they end up as for half the people in Illinois that come out of prison end up back in prison within three years. Now, our program, the reason why we want to get them employed is because when they get a job, that drops by more than 60 percent. What unless, drops? Uh, their, the recidivism rate. So under 20 percent end up going back. That's better for everyone. This community is safer. You know, um, people are now taxpaying uh, workers. They're not, we're not, as taxpayers, paying $38,000 or more a year to keep them incarcerated. So in our case, uh, in 2012, we were able to help about 4,200 people get jobs, all people with criminal records. That saved our state over $160 million, just that alone. So, you know, we, we want to be there to break this cycle because people coming out of prison, if they go back to those seven communities, Englewood, Garfield Park, you know, Lawndale, those communities, those happen to be some of the poorest communities and communities where they have low educational achievement. Those are the two critical things that drive people to criminality. So if we don't do something, what choice do they have? I mean, we, we, we can all ask ourselves, put me in that situation where there's no income. Ninety-five percent of our clients have no income at all when they come to us. So if we don't do something to give them income, what choice do they have? They, they kind of make a rational decision to do something irrational. And we would probably do the same thing if placed in the same situation. Let me ask you about this, though. Are there enough employers providing jobs for the number of felons who would like to work? No, not, not nearly enough. And one of the things that we, we have to do is there's some new EOC guidelines that require uh, employers to push the question about criminal record back further into the, the, the hiring process so they make it relevant to the position that they're hiring a person for. And so once those things begin to take hold, maybe the opportunities will open up. We have about 400 employers in Illinois that are hiring people with criminal records. 400? Uh, yeah, about 400 that we work with. And what we find is if we can help people develop the skills, if we can get them ready uh, to work through job readiness programs, uh, that employers will hire them because there's some real great need for certain skilled workers. And if we can help people get those skills, there are opportunities and employers will look beyond that criminal record and hire those people. Are you optimistic that you're going to see more people getting into programs like what SAFER has to try and reduce recidivism? Because they are closing prisons in the state like uh, Sheridan and others where um, people had a chance to be trained to come out of prison with a, a vocation. That's not happening. Well, I mean, I think we, we need much more done in this area of helping people re-enter society. Um, we were able to see about 10,000 clients in the course of a year, but there are over 30,000 people released from prison in Illinois every year, 600,000 or more in our country every single year. And so we need a whole lot more effort and a lot more funding, a lot more programs to help people get ready to be employed. It's a really strange thing. Ronald Reagan said the best social service is a job. There is one thing that can really help people break the cycle of poverty and give them choices in life, help them care for themselves, care for their family, make our community safer. That's getting them a job, getting them employed. Thank you, Victor. I wanted to give our panel members some final thoughts on you know, where we've been, um, how we address these issues, and where you'd like to see us go with respect to, say, the legal issues that we've discussed and what any other thoughts you may have? Well, I did want to share uh, two things. I have legislation um, that I hope to pass. One is that the uh, uh, Surgeon General of the Public Health Department of the U.S. government 
gives an annual report about uh, violence as a public health issue. And what the report would speak to is what it costs the United States, whether socially, morally, economically, because if you don't have the data, then it's hard to get things passed in Congress. So that's one piece of legislation. And the other piece of legislation um, that I have on the books where ex-felons, um, also veterans, um, companies that hire vets, um, that the bill will continue at least for five more years. So hopefully that will pass. Marlena, what about uh, the Department of Public Health? Uh, what, what are your thoughts? Um, what can what can be done, continued, or how would you expand? I think that um, we need to really continue with the 10 years plus work that has been happening in Chicago and across the state to recognize that childhood exposure to violence is important, is critical, it changes the trajectory of children starting at the very earliest moment that they have those encounters and that violence is a public health issue and that it is not something that can't be prevented. I mean, I have conversations with people all the time and the discussion oftentimes starts and ends with the question, so you're saying that violence is avoidable, that it's preventable, and it's a resounding yes, that we have to insert hope into the communities and into the individuals that we work with on a daily basis, that this is not something that is normal and it's not something that should be anticipated and it shouldn't be tolerated, yes, but we oftentimes um, expect it to happen and we deal with it with a level of normality that just kind of pushes down our need to f fight for change. So for me, I think that we have to continue to build stronger relationships across our silos that it's not just a public health in the health department. This is all of us working together toward a single outcome, and that is safe children, safe communities, and safe families, really, for a safe future for all of us. As an attorney, is there something that should be done towards looking at uh, the laws that are on the books now with respect to, um, well, I guess the, the, you talked about it earlier, the, the newest thing that's uh, so hot now is uh, uh, the superintendent talking about uh, the increased uh, crimes for uh, gun crimes. Yeah, uh, but then on the other hand, on the other end of the spectrum, when a parent brings their 18, 19, 20-year-old to me, I always tell them I have two goals. One is to avoid a felony conviction. And secondly, it is to put them in a position where at some point in time, what happened, the arrest, the fingerprints could either be expunged or sealed. So the kid has a chance to have a job, not worry about a felony conviction. There are all sorts of alternative programs other than the Department of Corrections. Day reporting at 26 in California is a wonderful program. Cook County Boot Camp is a wonderful program. The toughest judges at 26th Street know that these are good programs. And if those type of programs could be used to avoid warehousing people in the penitentiary, so be it. I'm not saying for a second there aren't some people that really deserve to be warehoused in the penitentiary. There are. But for your, your, most of the kids that come into the system that I call them graduates of juvenile court, nothing worked at juvenile court and they still haven't learned their lesson. They're going to end up at county jail. But as long as we have these alternative programs, as long as there are diversion programs that even the state's attorney's office is willing to consider, those are things that don't require legal changes, law changes. It's in practice things that can be done. That's well and good for all of us to sit up here and say, but if you are the victim of a crime, then it's, it's a different thing for victims uh, who feel that, um, who are seeking justice and who want something, some semblance of justice uh, for the fact that they have been harmed. And it is uh, the toughest part of being a member of the criminal justice system. Because on one hand, you look at the defendant's family in the galleries, and they're crying. And you look over on the other side, the victim's families are crying. But it's a, it's a hall of justice. And there has to be some place for both sides. There has to be punishment. There has to be deterrent. There has to be rehabilitation. Some of those don't exist in reality. But the goal, I think, that everyone would want were justice to prevail. And for the, the people that hurt these families here, hopefully someday there will be justice. But for the great majority of kids that are brought into the criminal justice system, 
There has to be light. There has to be a job. If there's no job, they're going to end up in the Department of Corrections. Thank you so much. Well, for years, Governor State University has been actively involved in community outreach to organize these efforts. Uh, they have recently launched the Center for Civic Engagement and Community Service. GSU's Respond to Violence initiative is a part of the new center. The project's centerpiece is an interactive respond to violence website. And we want to use information and media to bring about a positive change. The GSU faculty, staff, and students from all disciplines will participate through curriculum, service, volunteer activities, research, and education. And future video programs similar to the one that we have here this evening will drill down on the many issues related to violence and its prevention. These programs and other resources will be accessible through the site. And we welcome your ideas and partnerships as we respond through action and engagement. This is everyone's issue. These are our children. And we as a community and a country are all in this together. We'd like to thank our wonderful panel members for joining us tonight and shedding their wisdom and advice for us. And all of the audience members, for many of you, it had to have been a very tough time to sit here and monitor some of our videos and share your life experiences with us. And we'd like to thank you all for joining us. I'm Robert Jordan, and on behalf of Governor State University, good night.